Matthew 14 and 14. If you got it, say, I got it. If you're still looking, say, hold up. You ought to know where Matthew at church. I do. That first, that's that first book of the New Testament. Amen. <laughs> Touch your name and say, that way, that way, that way. <laughs> Matthew 14 and 14. The Bible says, and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them and healed their sick. And then when, when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time has now passed. Send the multitude away. In other words, they're getting on our nerve. Send them away. Have you ever wanted somebody to just get away? He said, send them away that they may go to the villages and buy their own food. <laughs> Y'all going to have a lot of people at your house today. You're going to be wanting, Lord, just send them away. Amen. But they're here today. Amen. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Feed them. And they said unto him, with what? We don't have anything but two fish and five loaves of bread. And Jesus said, bring them to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took five loaves and two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the bread to the disciples. You can't miss that. He never gave the bread to the people. We've been saying all this time, Jesus fed the 5,000. Yeah, okay. He blessed it and he broke it, but he did not feed them. Oh, God, help me in this place. He gave it to the disciples, and the disciples distributed it to the multitudes. And they did all eat, and they were all full, and they took all of the fragments that remained and put them in 12 baskets, and the baskets were full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides the women and the children. I want to talk about when it ends better than it started. I want you to touch everybody on your way down and say, this year may have started off rough for you, but God sent me to tell you it's about to end better. Oh, help me in this house. It's going to end better than it started. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Throughout Christendom and through theological dissertations and discussions amongst those who call themselves of the household of faith, Christians, church attenders, there is this compilation of conversations uh, that uh, there are just a few stories in the Bible that whether you're new to the church or whether you have been in church your whole life, whether you speak in tongues or whether you speak in English, <laughs> There's just certain stories that everybody knows. Everybody knows about Daniel and the lion's den. You know, you, you don't have to be saved to know that one. Everybody knows about the Hebrew boys and the fiery furnace. And everybody knows about Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They're just certain stories. The woman with the issue of blood. We know about that one. And there's just certain scriptures that everybody can quote. The Lord is my shepherd. Look at you. You're already finishing it. No weapon. Mm -hmm. I was young. There are just certain scriptures that roll off of the tongues of those who have sat in the pews for a multiplicity of years throughout history. You were raised in church. Your mama made you go to church. As soon as you could get grown, you stopped going, and now you're back. <laughs> it's a cycle. Uh, that all of us have been through. And likewise, this story about the 5,000, not including the women and the children, happens to be one of those stories uh, that has wide spectrums of acceptance throughout the church world. We all have heard about the 5,000, not including the women and the children. Uh, the problem is, is we have gotten at a junction 
and have gotten into the traffic jam of believing that this miracle is all about the food. When in actuality, the food is only the worm. It is the bait that brings us to understand uh, that after Jesus does this miracle by feeding them with the physical loaves, he then goes into the next chapter and preaches about him being the bread of life because the physical bread was only to solve the hunger so that they could hear about the spiritual bread. Uh, there is a sermon that he preaches in the next chapter in Capernaum as he begins to talk about uh, him being the bread of life uh, and that no one goes to the Father except by him. See, that's one thing that God is good at. He solves your immediate problems so that he can solve your eternal situation. Um, he'll, he'll show up and, and, he'll, and he'll heal the issue but with, about the blood, but it was never about the blood it was it was about the blood of Jesus you understand it it he'll show up and and he'll heal your blinded eyes but it was never about your sight it was about your vision so what he does is he comes and he solves one problem so that you can see that there was a bigger problem he solves the bread problem so he can solve the crisis he, he solves the hunger because when you are hungry you cannot hear Oh, God, help me in this place. When, when you have a need, when you have an appetite, when you have a desire for something, when your stomach or when your feelings or when your emotions are thriving or are, are, are desiring something, then all of your other faculties begin to shut down. So God says, I'm not going to throw my pearls to swine. And I don't want anybody to miss the sermon. I don't want them to miss the sermon because they heard their stomach. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve the stomach problem so they can hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. And so he shows up and he takes two fish and five loaves of bread and he breaks it and he blesses it and he gives it to them. And the Bible lets us know in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 and he says that there is neither no more slave nor free, no, no, no more male or female. There is no more Jew, no more Gentile. And why is this important? Because if you look at Matthew chapter 14, his first miracle that we're talking about here, he is now feeding 5,000 people in a Jewish area. But then if you go back to chapter 14, 15 you discover that he performs another miracle in a Gentile area see God came that there be no more Jew no more Gentile no more female no more male no more slave no more free and so in order to uh, make sure that his resume is substantial he not only comes to show us that he is a teacher and a preacher but he also shows up that he might see that he is a healer that he is uh, that he is more than just teaching and preaching that he is the bread of life that he is the true vine that that he is the savior of the world anybody know him to be a savior and so this text shows us God giving us a shadow pointing back towards uh, where he came from for the fact that there are 12 baskets of fish that are left over it's really not about the fish is God really saying I can feed the 12 tribes of Israel you see he's really showing us that there are shadows and types that that he is no more just a God to Abraham Isaac and Jacob but he is also the God to Paul and, and he's also the God to Silas and that he's also your God touch your name and say he's my God too so he comes and the veil is torn and the church is now open to those who are not just Jews but those who come from Fifth Ward and Fourth Ward and those who come from City Gas and people who were born in Gary, Indiana and people who come from the North and the South. He comes and kicks the door open on his own organization because the people tried to hijack the church and lock those of us who are not born of Jewish descent out. But I am so glad that we serve a God that does not treat me based on how other people treat me. Touch your neighbor and say, I don't deserve to be in, but I'm so glad God let me in. And I speak to somebody in here today that God is about to open doors that no man can shut. And he's going to shut doors that no man can open. Somebody say, God bless me in this place. And so he uses this moment as a prophetic mechanism to let us know that he is a way maker. That he is a miracle worker. That he is a promise keeper and that he is the light in the darkness. And I'm looking at some of y'all, maybe salvation to you uh, is something that you can overlook. And, and, and whenever I see people who are not excited about salvation, I know they don't have it. Because when you think about where you ought to be, and when you think about what God has saved you from, and when you think about who you really are, and you still get to go to heaven anyway, Lord, 
I'm going to talk to somebody over here. Some of y'all came to church today. You think God owes you something. You think you're going to heaven because you don't cuss no more. You think you're going to heaven because you don't sleep around no more. You think you're going to heaven because you're not going to have no French vanilla Ciroc today. You think you're going to heaven because you're going to finally not drink this Thanksgiving. But I'm going to tell some of y'all, y'all going to be sober today and still go to hell. And there's going to be some folk in here that's going to be drunk and still go to heaven. Why? Because it is not about my works, but I am saved by grace. And when you recognize that you are saved by grace, you start to give God glory in the midst of it. Slap somebody and say, I'm glad I'm saved. I don't know if there's anybody in here. I don't have to preach anything else. I don't have to take another text. I don't have to read another verse. If I can get 300 people to shout and thank God that no matter what, God has still got his hand on you, that you are still saved by grace, that you are not perfect, but you are saved, that you are not where you want to be, but you are saved. Somebody shout, I'm glad I'm saved. And so one thing we must settle, one thing we must settle is that the critics and the scholastic critics of yesterday in history suggest that, that there is not two miracles because, you know, the Bible talks about him feeding 5,000 and 4,000. And some suggest that it is a misnomer and a mistake that a story has been told so much. You know how when a story gets told, it don't never keep. You know, you know the guy, when he, when he actually played the basketball game, he scored seven points and had three rebounds. But by the time he tell his grandchildren, he had 45 points and 17 rebounds, and he was on his way to the NBA until he got hurt. You know how that thing just... Anybody know how the story expands? If I, if I whispered right here in Sister Kim's ear and, and told her story and she told everybody, by the time he gets to the back, I can tell her God loves you. By the time I get back there, there's somebody would say, Pastor, he ain't coming to church no more. You know the story just changed. And so as people continue to tell the story about the 5,000, some critics say, no, it was two stories that he fed. He, he didn't feed uh, just uh, 5,000 and feed 4,000. The story got overtold. He only performed the miracle once. But there's actually proof that there's two miracles because he feeds the 5,000. Watch this, taking it back to where we began. He feeds the 5,000 in Jewish territory, but he feeds the 4,000 in, in Gentile territory, showing us, watch this, Jews are God's chosen people. I'm about to help somebody in here today. So he goes and he feeds 5,000 chosen people and then goes and feeds 4,000 rejected people. All because God shows us not only does he feed the chosen, but he also chooses who he feeds. I wish I had somebody in here that would give your neighbor a high five and say, I'm blessed because I was chosen. Do I have any chosen people in here? I didn't come from a good family. My mama and daddy wasn't married. I don't know who my parents are. We didn't come from a rich place. I don't come from names and notoriety, but I'm here today because I've been chosen. Would all of the chosen people spend about 30 seconds giving God... Somebody shout, that's favor. Favor is unmerited grace. I can't explain why he loves me. I cannot explain why he cares. And you know what? I'm done trying to explain it. All I know is that God has been good to me. Is there anybody in the lighthouse today on Thanksgiving want to give God thanks that you might not have been chosen, but thank God he chose you? God, is, he, just, he just picks people to bless. Some of y'all don't even know. You're about to be randomly selected for a miracle. You don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. You're not living up to the standard. But God going to say, you know what? I pick them. I pick you to be blessed. What is it? What manner of man is this? You see, they're going to look at you and say, why are you, why, God, why, why are they being blessed? Why, why, what did they do? Nothing. He just picked you. See, y'all don't know. You don't know when to shout. You don't know when to shout. Touch your name and say, I've been picked. I've been picked. It ain't my fault. It ain't my fault I'm this cute. Just tell them it ain't my fault. I, I didn't mean to be this fine. Tell them it ain't my fault. I didn't mean to have this much swag. He made me like this. I didn't mean to be this blessed. He picked me. If it was up to what I was, I wouldn't have it. If it was up to my attitude, I would have lost it. But thanks be to God that I'm picked for this. He, 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 he feeds those who are chosen. And then he turns around and chooses who he feeds. And feeds people that other people say they don't deserve it. God said, I didn't ask you. 
I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you, should I bless them? I did it under my own volition and under my own will. Anybody here glad that God don't ask people about what he ought to do for you? And is there anybody here that knows that you got more than you deserve going further than you, than you have earned? I just need you to just give God, if you don't do nothing else, just thank him that you have been chosen. Slap your neighbor and say, I've been chosen. I've been chosen. The next time we see this text, Jesus, when we read this text, the Bible says that Jesus is tired. Go to Mark chapter 6, 31. When you get home, the Bible says that there were so many people coming at Jesus, that there were so many people coming to him, you know, because when you perform one miracle, everybody want one. So, so, so he feeds the, a few people. Now everybody coming, talking about, hey, we cousins. I was, I was related to Mary back in the day. You know, you know. <laughs> so now all of a sudden he got people coming from everywhere. And, 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 and the Bible says that he was so tired and bombarded by the people that he didn't have time to eat. So that's what happens when you serve. Some of you are going to be serving today, and you're going to be the last one to eat. You, you're going to be making sure that everybody else is okay. But, but watch this. All the people you serve, very few of them are going to say, sit down and eat something for yourself. They're just going to let you serve them. They're going to let you serve them. They're going to eat all your food. They, they, they ain't going to offer to clean up. They're going to eat all your food. They're going to walk all over your floor. They're going to leave dishes everywhere. Their kids going to put their little nasty hands on your couch. They ain't going to do nothing. They ain't going to say nothing. Some of y'all ain't saying amen because I'm talking about your son. That's why. That's all right. That's all right. Just get it together before we get out of here. Amen, church. Bible says that he was so tired that, 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 that he didn't even have an opportunity to eat. So he says to the disciples, he says, come with me so we can get away from these people and get some rest. Even Jesus got tired of people. Amen. He's got, he got tired and, and, and the Bible says fatigue came over him. But watch this. Then all of a sudden, 5,000 people show up hungry and Jesus climbs over his fatigue climbs over his attitude, climbs over his disposition, and serves the people. Are you with me so far? The Bible says a multiplicity of times that Jesus had compassion on them. You remember there were two blind men, and the Bible says that Jesus saw the two blind men, and he had compassion on them. You remember the widow at name? The Bible says that he sees the widow woman, and he has compassion for her. Remember when the Bible talks about the leper that nobody else would touch, nobody else would talk to, nobody else would deal with? The Bible says that Jesus had compassion on him. Even in his parables, the Bible lets us know that God is compassionate. If you read Matthew chapter 18, you remember the king had compassion. There was a servant that went bankrupt, and he owed the king a debt. And the Bible says that he had compassion on him and forgave his debt. I'm getting ready to help somebody in here. And then in Luke chapter 10, there was a Samaritan uh, who, was, who was walking on the wayside. And the Bible says that the preachers passed him up and the church folk passed him up. But, but the Samaritan went to him after they had beat him and left him half dead, and, and he had compassion on him. Him. Are y'all with me so far? And then the Bible talks about a father who had a son who wanted all of his inheritance, and he left and spent all of his money and right his living, but he decided he wanted to come home. And the Bible says that when the father saw him afar off, he did not remind him what he did. The Bible says that the father ran out and hugged the prodigal son and had what? Compassion on him. When I began to read those three things, God gave me a word for you today that there are three things that God is getting ready to bless in your life. The Bible says, number one, he forgave a debt. Number two, the Bible says that he sent help for a man who was beaten half to death. And number three, the Bible says that he forgave a man for his mistakes. And in the next season of your life, God told me he's about to do three things in your life. Forgive your debts. Oh, y'all not here with me today. Send you somebody to help you and forgive you for all of your... Let me talk to somebody over here. It's about to get better for you. Touch your neighbor saying this next season, God's about to help you with your money. God's about to send you somebody who's going to help you, and he's going to forgive you for your sins. I don't know who I'm talking to in the lighthouse, but in the next year, you're going to be forgiven, rich, and have some help. <laughs> Preach to yourself, Keon, because they tripping. If I ain't talking, you go to sleep, but I need all the healthy rich folk to stand up and make some noise and begin to give God praise, debt cancellation, help coming in your direction, and forgiveness of sin. Now, I want somebody to think about it. 
Because right now, the only thing you're thinking about is the stuff you think people know about. But I want you to start thinking about that stuff that if we knew what you was doing up in this church right now, we all start going crazy. I want you to think about the worst thing that you've ever done. Here is the word of the Lord, forgiven. Nope, that ain't the, you ain't thinking about the right one. You ain't thinking about the right one. I'm going to say it again. I can tell you're thinking about that cute sin. I'm talking about your little nasty self, your little freaky self, your little ugly, nasty self. Look at your neighbor and say, forgiven. Now, I want all of the people in here who know that if it had not been for God on your side, Guys, I'm going to forgive you. I got three areas of forgiveness for you. The area of money, the area of your mistakes, <laughs> and the area of the people that God's getting ready to send in your life who are getting ready to help you. They beat the man and left him half dead. That was the enemy's biggest problem. It's because if I'm half dead, I'm still half alive. Touch your name and say, he should have killed me when he had the chance. But I got one more praise. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I, I, you know, don't make me come to Thanksgiving, y'all be this dead. I, I wish I could have about 30 seconds of y'all just giving God Thanksgiving and praise. That your money is about to get right, your mistakes are forgiven, and God is about to send men to help you. Somebody say money, mistakes, and men. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Shall men give unto your bosom. God's about to send somebody. People always talking about what, what goes on in the dark comes in the light. Do you know that God, see, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. That's just for spiritual, illiterate people. God ain't ever been about exposing people. And if what's done in the dark does come to the light, Jesus is the light. I'm glad it's coming to the light. Slap your neighbor and say, I'm glad it's coming to the light. Because he's got the only light that covers. Use your imagination. Five thousand okay raise your hand if you're hungry in here okay and it ain't even five thousand of us in here right now but if we get a little more hungry than what we are right now we're gonna set it off up in here amen church how many y'all you on thanksgiving you don't even eat so you can eat i don't want no breakfast don't give me no breakfast i, I don't want i don't want no water me no want no water i don't want it i want to wait i want to wait i want to wait you wait, you wait, and you smell it, and you wait, and you wait, and, and, and you stem cooking, and you want to go get a spoon and just dig it in there, but you wait. They didn't wait on the Lord. Some of y'all stopped eating yesterday so you can eat today. You was counting calories. Okay, I got 15 calories, and I can only have 17 today, so I ain't going to eat no apples yesterday. I'm going to carry the calorie over, carry the one, add two. How many of y'all been saving calories? Come on now, look at your boy. Don't play with me. I know you. The disciples knew that Jesus was powerful enough to solve the problem, but they never asked him for help. They looked around and they say, man, we got 5,000 hungry folks out here. And they say, okay, man, go, uh, Judas, go check the money. You know, he was the, the accountant. Judas said, man, we ain't got about a couple of hundred pennies up in here. So we can't feed all these people. We don't have enough resources to feed the people. They ain't even asked God for his help. So they start taking inventory of their own supply. And one of them said, well, it is a little dude around here. So you know, your lunch ain't safe when I'm hungry. Oh, y'all missed that whole thing. You got to be careful when you got meat around hungry people. That's why you got to make sure that everybody in your friendship circle ain't hungry because. See, when, when everybody you hang around is hungry, they eat your stuff. So he said, they said, all right, little boy, come up off of it. That's Devo bite. 
<laughs> little dude got his lunch. They like, nah, bro. Hey, <laughs> either you give it or we're going to take it. The little boy said, I don't want no trouble, disciples. I don't want no disciples. I don't want no trouble. So he gave up his lunch. And they, when they went over there, they was like, all right, we got two fish and five loaves. Everybody was like, man, what are we going to do with that? It's 5,000 people out here, not including. Are y'all listening to me today? When they considered the time of day, it was evening, and the place, it's a desert, they decided there is nothing we can do for the people. And they said, Jesus, as your council of advisors, we have a suggestion for you. Send them away. Get rid of them. They're hungry, and it ain't our fault. We got two fish, five loaves. That's enough for us. I'm trying to open up your mind. I say use your imagination. It's enough for us. All right, Drew, don't eat as much as you ate last time. We're going to break off this bread. We're going to break off this fish. Just keep that in the family. But these other 5,000, they're going to have to go for what they know. I mean, can't save the world. How many of y'all would have been talking like that? Come on now. Y'all sitting up there talking about it. That's a shame. If it was two fish and five loaves of bread in here, and, it was, and, and all of us was hungry, and the bread was in your hand, who would you starve? Who, who, would, you, who would you say, hey, bro, <laughs> you my dog and all that, but Jesus paid it all. It ain't my job to feed you, you know. Lord, send him away. Andrew found a little boy with a lunch. The boy gave him a lunch. The Bible says God took the lunch from the disciples. He blessed it. Lord, thank you for this food we're about to receive for the nourishment of our body. He broke it. Then I recognize that the blessing is in the breaking. that when God breaks you, he's trying to distribute you. <laughs> that the reason why God keeps breaking you is because he wants you in more than one place. He wants you in more than one city. He doesn't, he doesn't, he does, he doesn't just want you to have clients in your surrounding areas. He, he, he wants to break you so they'll come from the east, the west, the north, and the south. Do I have anybody here that's trying to do something big? Just give your neighbor high five and say, the blessing is in the breaking. It was good that I was afflicted that I might know the statues of God. The blessing is in the breaking. The more God breaks you down, the more he can build you up. The blessing is in the breaking. Those shattered moments in life where you don't know whether you're going or coming. Those moments when you are so confused, you lay awake at night with anxiety, and you're wondering, why, God, why hast thou forsaken me? And you don't understand that with every lash and with every tear of the skin and with every breaking, there was a bigger purpose that God cannot accomplish to you until you're broken enough to be distributed. He breaks the bread and he says to them, give it to me. I'm going to multiply it, but I am not going to distribute it. He says the distributing is up to you. See, the reason why the world is still hungry is because God took it, he blessed it, and he broke it but then he gave it to you. God says, you are not the manufacturer, but you are the distributor. And God told me to tell somebody in this church today, 
get ready because God is getting ready to take the blessing. He's going to break it and he's going to multiply it. Then he's going to give it to you to distribute it. Some of y'all need to get ready because the next blessing is coming through your hands. Tell somebody, say, it's coming through my hands. Some of y'all been asking God for a miracle. God says, I'm going to create the miracle, but then I'm going to give it to you. And then I'm going to let you decide who you're going to bless. Somebody say, God, make me a distribution center. You can trust millions of dollars in my hands. You can trust a business in my hands. You can trust a company in my hands. You can trust a business in my hands. You can trust influence in my hands. What you don't understand is that God is going to use you to do the blessing. God didn't feed those people. The disciples did. God multiplied it, but they had to distribute it. You better get ready to become a distribution center. You better get ready to become a warehouse and a storehouse. You better get ready for God to fill your closets and your barns and your barrels. You better get ready for your bank accounts to be full. You better get ready for your house to be full. Why? Because God is going to give you so much blessing, not so you can keep it, but so you can. Imagine being so rich that it's too much for you to keep. Imagine having so much fish that you got 12 baskets of leftovers. Imagine being so blessed that you don't need all of your connections, that you can give them to somebody else. Imagine being so blessed that you don't need all of your houses. Imagine being so blessed that you can't drive all of your cars. Y'all not listening to me. God says, I'm going to multiply, but then I'm going to give it to you so you can distribute it. Somebody say, God, bless these hands that I might be a distribution center. Do I have anybody here with the right heart to distribute? Matter of fact, give your neighbor a high five and shout, neighbor, you are sitting next to somebody that God's about to multiply. You are sitting next to somebody who God is about to bless. You are sitting next to somebody who's in the year of elevation. You are sitting next to somebody who's about to go to the next level. I want all the next level people to shout. Somebody shout, start with what you have. Watch this. He blessed it. He broke it. And then he breeded it. <laughs> he blessed it. He broke it. He breeded it. What do I mean? Whenever you breed something, it produces offspring. This is the only time in the world where dead fish had babies. Because God will bless you where you'll give birth in a dead place. I wish I had somebody in here. You're looking from life from your living places. God says, I'm about to give CPR to your dead place, and you're going to see growth in something you thought was done. Give your neighbor a high five and say, dead things are about to live. Dead things. Dead fish don't spawn, but when God blesses it, and when God touches it, he'll take a dead thing and make it produce. You better get ready for checks to come with no job. <laughs> get ready for more money to multiply. Some of y'all are going to look at your bank account and say, I don't know where this came from, but thanks be to God. I don't know where this came from, but God must have touched it. He must have blessed it. He must have broke it, and he breeded it. Your money's about to have money. Slap, I wish somebody just touched a pocket and say they're pregnant. They're pregnant. My dollars are going to have fives. My fives are going to have tens. My tens are going to give birth to twenties. My twenties are going to have hundreds. Y'all don't, y'all ain't talking. I'm about to go home. Y'all getting on my nerves. I'm talking about how God will take a dad thing. You think God can't bless you with that job you got? I don't make enough. God will multiply it. God will take that check you think ain't enough and do something with it. I don't know who I'm talking to. Matter of fact, just sit up and say, God, do something with it. Do something with it. Do something with my money. Do something with my child. Do something with my marriage. Do something with my mind. Work all things together for my good. He blessed it. He broke it. And he breeded it. And now we see dead fish having fish. The Bible says every time they go into the bucket... Most stuff keep coming out. Every time they go in, more fish. Can you imagine? Everybody eating the fish, but the bucket don't go down. 
You eat some bass, another one comes. Eat some tilapia. I don't know what kind of fish it was, but I do know it wasn't the same kind of fish because the Bible says fishes. So whatever kind of fish you eat, that's what kind he'll give you. Y'all ain't talking to me. Just touch your neighbor. Whatever kind you want. God never leaves anything empty. Everything God touches, he fills. He touches empty eyes and gives them sight. He touches empty mouths and gives his speech. He touches empty nets and they got 156. Everything God touches, he always fills. God never left anything empty except for a tomb. <laughs> y'all missing it. Ooh, y'all ain't ready for church on a Thursday. The only thing that he ever left empty was a grave. Everything else he filled. Everything else he filled. Everything else he filled. He left the tomb empty, but everything else he filled. Slap somebody and say, use what you got. You tell all I got is two fish and five loaves. That's until he touches it. All I make is $10 an hour. That's until he blesses it. All I got is a two-bedroom apartment. That's until he breaks it and blesses it and then breeds it. Multiplication in this season. Multiply. Everybody say multiply, multiply, multiply. Multiply, 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 multiply. You're not even going to see it. It's just going to start happening. Stuff just going to start popping off. You're going to walk in the blessings. Where that came from? The Lord blessed it, broke it, and he distributed it. And what people ain't ready for is they are used to you having to come to get the blessing. They are not yet used to having to come to you. God's about to reverse traffic. He's about to reverse traffic. You used to have to go get the blessing, and now he's going to send people to you to get the blessing. He says, after I bless you, it's going to be all kinds. Can y'all see them bones everywhere? Can you see the little boy going home and tell his mama, Mama, you ain't going to believe what happened. <laughs> mama, I had two fish and five loaves, and this dude with this bronze hair, this sheep's hair and his bronze feet, and he just, he, he, I don't know, they, they said his name was Jesus. And he took my little fishy mama, and he took my breads. You know, kids can't talk. You know that, right? He took my breads and my fishes, mama, and he just multiplied it. Can you imagine how much fish and bread he took home? He left the house with a lunch sack. He went home. Mama, mama, look, because God will always send you home with more than you left with. I want somebody in this place to know that God will multiply anything. That you give to him. He went home with baskets. Mama I left home. I can't, I, I, I went out there and caught a little two fish and five barley loaves, but look at what I came back with. Twelve baskets of leftovers. He's the God of the Jew and the Gentile, 12 tribes of Israel. Now he's got a basket for every tribe, signifying that there's overflow for every tribe. And that there is nobody who will go to him and leave from him hungry. He will solve. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches. But here it is. You got to use what you got. But lastly, you got to be a steward over your results. Don't ever be so blessed that you don't collect the leftovers. I know people, I, I see people right now that get blessed. It ain't nothing but a dollar. I know you don't know what you're talking about. It ain't nothing but five cents. Don't worry about it. You see a cord on the ground and you walk over it. You got to be crazy. I don't see nothing and walk over it. So you, you done got so rich that you just throw food away. You, you done just got so rich, about, oh, it ain't nothing but five dollars. All right, you keep it up. That's not being a good steward over the baskets. Because if you get enough fives, if you collect enough pennies, come on, talk to me. If you collect enough dollars, a steward is somebody who takes what you have and brings it back to you, at least in the condition that they took it. 
Now, that's a steward. What's a good steward? Now, imagine I gave you the keys to my car, Brother, brother Joe. Now, if he took my car and, and drove it, his responsibility is at least to bring it back to me in the same condition that I gave it to him. But a good steward will take it and go get the tank filled, just in case you're listening, and get it washed. The person who brings the car back just like you gave it to them, they can get it. The person who brings it back better, you start asking them, do you need... Uh, What am I saying? God is watching what you do with the leftovers. He is paying attention to what you do with your extra money. What do you do when you pay all your bills and you got an extra 50? What are you doing with the scraps? Because that determines whether he uses you as a distribution center. If you think that just because you got extra money, that means you got to go get lit. You are not a good steward. Oh, I, I, I got, <laughs> I'm blowing some of y'all mind right now. I got a few extra dollars. I'm going to go shop it. No. I got a few extra dollars. I'm going to save. God says, oh, you save your scraps? Here's some more. Somebody said, I got it. If I just got, thank you. I'm done. Let's go home. Let's go. Stand up. She got it. I'm ready. I'm done, for real. I was only wanting somebody to get it. She said, I get it. Church is over. Let's go home. I'm serious. Stand up. We're done. I'm absolutely serious. She said, who said that? She said, I get it. Young lady, you just made church over. We're done. If there's anybody in this place today that has never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this will be a good time for you to do it. I only came here today so you would get it. If somebody get it, I'm done. I didn't come here for you to see me. I didn't come here to preach a long time. I didn't come here to belabor the point. If you got it, I have done my job. He blesses it. He breaks it. And he breeds it. Because your blessings are going to start having offspring. When your blessings have babies. See, you're going to make money in your sleep. People say, well, why are you talking about money? Well, that's the first thing the disciples said. They said, we don't have enough money to feed these people. Jesus sent them away. See, some of y'all would help, but you don't have the money to do it, so, so you send them away. If you had the house that was big enough, you let people live in it. If you had the money to be a blessing, you'd be a blessing. But, but when you look at what you have, it's not enough, so you send them away. God says, I'm about to give you a new season. I'm going to use you as a distribution center. I'm not going to increase the size of your house so you can brag. I'm going to increase it because you got a heart to let people live with you. I'm going to, I'm going to give you multiple cars, not so you can floss and be a boss, but because I know that you'll use those cars to get people to job interviews and to, to bless them with opportunities. And I'm not going to bless you with money so you can be rich. I'm going to bless you with money so you can be a blessing. On this Thanksgiving, for those of y'all who are leaving, I know some of us are going to go and we're going to sit around our tables and we're going to laugh and we're going to have fun and some of you are going to go to your homes and sit in memories about how painful this time of year is and how hard it was that you lost a loved one around this time last year or the year before. You know when you really love somebody, a decade can't put the fire out whatever it is whatever this season means to you he's always doing three things he's always blessing you he's always breaking you the breaking is for breeding two things of the Lord word of the Lord today use what you got all you got is two fish and five loaves. That's what you use. Stop complaining about what you don't have and use what you have. 
Stop talking about who you are not and start thanking God for who you are. Stop talking about where you are not yet and thank God that you are not where you should be. And then be a good steward over the leftovers. Some of us like the lady with the dog and licking the crumbs off the table. But you know, Joe, if you get enough crumbs, you can make a loaf. The problem is, is when we see crumbs, we sweep them off the table because they're so insignificant. But if you gather enough crumbs, if you, get, if you, if you stop scattering the crumbs and collecting the crumbs, you'd have what the person with the loaf has if you can understand that just because it doesn't look the same doesn't mean it isn't the same. A person with five pounds of bread and a person with five pounds of crumbs has the same blessing. One just is in disguise. I speak and I pray over your life today that you would start to appreciate your crumbs. That you would know that it's going to end better than it started because when this thing started, the meal was only for the Jews. But God opened a reservation and let Gentiles to the table. And I say to every one of you all who've been rejected and left out, God says, it's about to be greater later for you. Somebody shout greater later. God, I speak blessings over our hearts, our minds, our ministries, our situations, our circumstances, our lives. 